Welcome to our third overview video, conceptualizing the structural system in terms of mutually bracing sheets of material. In a previous video, we talked about this little beam demonstration where a 1 16th inch thick by three inch deep sheet of styrene is loaded and it's got enough depth to be pretty stiff but unfortunately, because of the bending stresses in the top of the beam, which become like axial stresses, so the top of the beam along the length of the beam is like a little column. That column in a state of compression wants to buckle, and so we begin to see this uh, sideways movement as that uh, elastic instability occurs. So one of the things we mentioned is that we can take a beam that has some lateral instability or tendency to buckle to the side on the top and we can attach a diaphragm or a sheet sort of floor um, decking and that floor decking can act as a sheet of material restraining the top of the beam against moving sideways. We also talked about the fact that we can make the beam self-bracing. So instead of a three inch deep uh, styrene beam, we can take that and cut it into three one inch wide strips and glue it back together in the form of an eye section, which has a one inch wide top flange, a one inch wide bottom flange, and a one inch deep web. And this system is not only deep enough and stiff enough but it also is able to take a lot more weight because the performance is no longer limited by elastic instability or lateral buckling of this web material because the web material is braced on the top by the top flange. So this is a classic uh, wide flange section where we have a top flange that's strong in the horizontal direction, a bottom flange that's strong in the horizontal direction, and a web which is strong in the vertical direction. Where these things connect together, where the top flange connects to the web, for example, the top flange stabilizes the web laterally, and likewise the web stabilizes the top flange vertically. And we have a similar interaction down at the bottom where the bottom flange stabilizes the web against horizontal movement and the web stabilizes the flange against vertical movement. Now, this is a classic application of this notion of mutually bracing sheets of material. Another one is corrugated decking where this horizontal element right here connects to this vertical sheet which connects to a horizontal, which connects to a roughly vertical sheet. And everywhere those thin sheets of metal intersect with each other, they brace each other mutually. Now, this was all made out of a flat sheet and it was rolled or deformed into the shape. So there was no necessity for welding or making connections along this line. But every one of these connections there and along here and along here and so forth, uh, is a location of high stability where two mutually bracing sheets of material are intersecting. Now, the mutually bracing sheets of material may not look exactly like sheets to you. For example, here we have a roof diaphragm, which is strong against forces in the horizontal direction. It's like a very deep beam, uh, and that's a sheet of material that's very stable against horizontal movement. Um, this truss now is kind of like a sheet of material. It's a sheet of material with giant holes in it, but it's very stable and very strong against vertical forces. So where this uh, planar truss at the top um, cord meets this roof diaphragm, the two things are mutually bracing. Um, unfortunately, there's nothing bracing the bottom edge of this truss, but you'll notice that there are some struts coming down on each side periodically to help brace the bottom of that also. 
Okay, so we take that concept and we blow it up even larger. So we're, we're going through a scale here where we have something small scale, which is just a building component, but the building component represents mutually bracing sheets of material. Here's another building component in the form of this corrugated decking, which is a low scale or small scale component uh, level example of mutually bracing sheets of material. Now the material has gotten much more expansive. We have an entire roof diaphragm that represents one sheet of material and a planar truss in the vertical plane that represents another. Uh, we can scale that up even larger and in this case we have trusses that are so deep we've formed a bridge. So on the top here we have a horizontal sheet of material that represents the roof diaphragm which is very strong relative to horizontal forces. Here we have a floor diaphragm, which is corrugated metal with concrete cast on top of it with reinforcing all through the concrete. So it becomes like a deep horizontal beam. Um, and then those two diaphragms intersect this deep vertical truss. So people now, it's, it's a tall enough and deep enough truss that people can actually walk through the bridge. The nice thing is that really deep truss can also span a very long distance. So the concept for this probably didn't start with this notion of a tube with a floor diaphragm on the bottom and a roof diaphragm on the top and deep trusses on both sides. Probably the designers looked at the situation and said, wow, we're going to have to span um, 300 feet here and we need uh, a certain depth or say 200 feet and we need uh, at least a 10 foot deep truss to do that. Why don't we pull that truss up above the floor diaphragm and then the truss can support the roof, it can support the floor. And all of those sheets of material are mutually bracing where they intersect each other. Here's another example. Here's a very deep truss on the side. This is an escalator, by the way, in the lobby of the CNN building in Atlanta, Georgia. I think they've probably moved uh, or redecorated at this point because this was quite a few years ago. But here's a very deep, very long truss. And then there's another fully triangulated truss on the other side. So those two trusses represent two vertical sheets of material. And then here is a horizontal sheet of material, which is stabilized through these moment connections. So this is not as good as a fully triangulated truss. We'd have been better off if we'd had diagonals here. But the presumption in this case is there's essentially no wind loads because it's inside the lobby. The primary loads are the weight of the escalator and the people on the escalator. So the vertical planes have been fully triangulated and the horizontal planes have just been uh, given this kind of ladder or moment frame configuration. Now we can take some basic common building materials like wood. Wood is usually limited in length so we have issues of continuity and and then we try to stack things like blocks and we discover that this is a very weak system. Um, for years we did something called post and beam where we put stiff knees in here but that never worked very well and it also didn't do anything to contribute to the building envelope. So in modern construction, what we do is we start with those two by fours and we nail them together like this and in grain nailing into uh, this stud and that stud. And this could be the, the plate at the bottom of the wall. And then there'll be a double plate at the top of the wall. But when we build something like that, we discover that's a very weak system. So here we have, for those uh, vertical studs nailed to a base and nailed to a top plate. And literally this person with one finger is able to push that structure over and fail it. In other words, those are very weak joints. However, we can nail to those studs a sheet of oriented strand board or plywood. And then suddenly the direction in which the studs are really weak the whole system becomes much stronger because the oriented strand board is very capable of resisting forces in that direction. So we have two by four studs that are strong edge on or perpendicular to this wall. And then we have the oriented strand board, which is very strong 
in the direction parallel to the wall. And to give you an idea of how stiff and strong this is, here you have that baseboard uh, lying flat, more or less, on the concrete. And here you have this person exerting this force. And the force he's exerting is so extreme that it's actually lifting up at this point, pushing down at that point, and creating this crown and the beam at the bottom which is a good indicator of the fact that this wall right now under this influence is an extremely strong and extremely stiff wall or beam i should be, say it's a beam cantilevering up out of this base and this piece is so strong that it's easily able to bend the piece at the bottom now we've been talking about component level things and then things at the scale of the building, um, this idea of perpendicular mutually bracing sheets of material, which are either perpendicular or close to perpendicular to each other, that's how they brace each other. They can't be coplanar. Co they have to be uh, at a reasonably good angle to each other. We can apply that at the level of the entire building. So here we have a model that might represent in, in uh, chipboard, the sheets of material. So this could be uh, um, hollow core concrete um, masonry wall. Um, this would be a little strip footing across the base, which is all that needs to resist gravity. But when you push on it like this, it keels over really easily. And to give you an idea of how important this is, the most common cause of death on construction sites are people crushed under walls, masonry walls or other kinds of walls, which have not been braced properly during the construction process. So it takes almost no wind to blow this over, almost no lateral force, because actually this base was designed, this foundation was designed to resist the gravity loads it's probably sitting on top of some fairly soft soil and that soft soil just redistributes itself really easily. So this is not a good moment connection and not a good source of stability for this wall. So in the case of this person push it, pushing with her finger, um, it was almost an imperceptible resistance do, from that wall. You could barely feel it at the end of one's finger uh, the force was so min minimal. Now if we connect these walls together at the corners, uh, suddenly what was an unstable wall becomes much more substantial. Uh, you can't just push it over. Um, it, it is very, very strong near the corners where it's braced. So this wall is wanting to fall over in that direction. And these walls, which are coming in perpendicular to it, we sometimes call shear walls but they are the bracing sheets of material that are stabilizing the wall that this finger is pushing on. So that finger could represent a wind load or some kind of lateral force from seismic. Um, but basically this structure where the walls are bracing each other is suddenly a much better structure. And now it gets even better because the weak part of that wall was out near the center and if we come with a roof diaphragm or a floor diaphragm that stabilizes the top edge of that wall, we have yet another intersection of mutually bracing sheets of material. It's an incredibly important concept, which, by the way, is used in more than 99% of the modern buildings that we design. You just don't find buildings very often that are somehow stabilized by their dead weight. Um, and even things like Gothic cathedrals, if you think about it, the walls represent one sheet of material and the flying buttresses represent another sheet of material. And those flying buttresses were put on the outside in order to free up the interior space. Um, that bracing function could have been accomplished by floor diaphragms, but we didn't want floors at, ever, at uh, intervals within that space. We might want 150 or 200 foot tall uh, space in our cathedral and we want it uninterrupted by structure. So we move the sheets of material in the form of flying buttresses to the outside of the building. So one of the things we're going to do in this course is we're going to take uh, the various parts of a building and we're going to do free body diagrams where we sketch 
uh, what's happening to the various parts. So for example, here we have wind over pressure on this wall, which is resisted along the foundation edge. It's also resisted at the top edge due to the roof diaphragm. So the roof diaphragm is pushing back to help resist the wind loads, which means by action reaction pairs, the top of the wall is pushing on the edge of the roof. The roof, the, the roof diaphragm is then like a huge horizontal beam, which also, by the way, has some suction force on the other side. And then there are forces along these edges where the roof diaphragm attaches to the shear wall. So the shear wall is exerting a force in that direction by action reaction pairs. The diaphragm roof is pushing in that direction on the shear wall. And then finally, the resistance at the base uh, of the foundation is what ultimately stabilizes the building. So we're going to do diagrams like this, but this diagram is sort of the simple heart and soul of this whole concept of mutually bracing sheets of material. So here we have some kind of a building frame, which in this case has got pretty slender columns and really thin floors and exhibits very large deformation under the influence of the horizontal force being exerted by this finger. So these columns started off straight, but now the structure is bent over. Uh, that can be stabilized by putting in shear walls. Shear walls generally have this sort of punched opening aesthetic in the sense that if you open up big openings in this wall, it won't act like a shear wall anymore. Um, and a lot of our sort of classical brick construction has this kind of uh, punched aperture aesthetic. Um, some people find that very unsatisfying because they want lots of glass in the exterior walls. Uh, these kinds of shear walls can be moved to the interior of the building. And perhaps the most dramatic example of that is the Burj Khalifa, which is basically a shear wall stabilized structure. It's the tallest building in the world as of right now. And if you look internal, there's an, a two foot thick wall here that's running in that direction and another two foot thick wall, which by the way, those are very, very strong shear walls. Um, and they are now referred to actually as buttresses in this situation. Um, and we have another set here and another set there. And what's really nice about this is that those are not just profoundly important structural elements, but they are also uh, really outstanding fire protection for people going into that corridor. So this is a really excellent example of um, shear wall stabilization of the building. And you'll notice these shear walls are coming out and engaging these walls coming off to the side. Those walls are helping to stabilize this material, that sheet of material and that sheet of material against movement in this direction. You'll notice something else. Um, these things generally would not be very good in torsion, but the interior core of this building is done as a tube. So uh, this is sometimes referred to as a buttressed core, where this is the structural core, which is the source of torsional resistance. And then these are the buttressing elements that come out and stabilize it. Uh, we can also cross brace things as a means of stabilization. You can't walk through this very well, but you can get light through it and you can get ventilation through it and you can put it on the exterior of the building. And this is a classic example. This is a truss tube and the truss was put as far near the perimeter of the building as possible uh, in order to create the most stable structure. Uh, in the case of the Burj Khalifa, uh, they basically created a very wide base by thrusting out these elements as far as possible. Uh, in the case of the um, Hancock building, I hope I didn't call this the Sears Tower. This is the Hancock building in Chicago. Uh, and this truss tube and all the columns that are associated with that truss tube have been put out at the absolute boundary of the building. Another example of this is the new Hearst building with this diagrid structure. It's basically a trust tube also. So here we have a sheet of material that's very stable. 
it's interac interacting with another sheet of material at the corners, just as is the case of uh, the Hancock building, where here we have a very stable sheet of material that's intersecting another stable sheet of material, and they are mutually bracing. This is an even more dramatic example. This is the Citigroup building in New York. Um, it's been called Citicorp, Citigroup, uh, Citibank. It was, the structural system was designed by William LeMessure. And you'll notice this entire exterior wall is triangulated. So it's a truss and that truss intersects with the trusses on the adjacent side. Um, these trusses are designed with a sort of K bracing. If you put your head to the side, you can see this looks like a K right here. Those elements combined with those elements form a K. Um, they are converging at the center. So loads are being pulled down that face to this huge column at the boundary. Um, this is a very dramatic example of what you can do with some imagination. Normally we want to get our structure out as far as possible, but in the case of this building, the designers had this desire to accommodate uh, a church here, which that chur a church for that congregation already existed there. The people who built the city group building um, bought the air rights over that church and then built them another church um, as, as a way of uh, persuading them to give up their air rights. And then this corner is a really beautiful um, public space for the city of New York. And then the other two corners are taken up by this mall, which sort of wraps around the back side of this building. Uh, this is the image of that corner. So you have these other buildings where the buildings come right into the corner and people are forced to come close to traffic and pass around that corner. Well, in the case of this building, um, you have this sense of openness and space and a place that people can go and hang out or eat or whatever. This is just an aerial view of that. That's the church below. These are the major columns on the outside of the building. And this is the trust core, which handles the shear forces on the building. Here's another example of uh, a building with a really broad base, but it also has perpendicular sheets of material. So. We have a sheet of material coming up this face and down there, and then another material, a sheet of material on that face coming down. And then here at this edge, we have another sheet of material going in there and creating a square corner. So we have a square in the sort of plan, or if we cut a section through this, we have one, two, three, four corner pieces, and there's a sheet of material on each of those faces. So those are mutually braced sheets of material. And then if you look really close up, you have exactly the same pattern of truss work in these web members. So it's, it's uh, trust, then it's trust again, and then it's trust again. So there are three levels of trussing, but the crucial thing here is everything in this building has a mutually bracing sheet of material. If there's a sheet of structural material, there's a mutually bracing sheet that helps to keep it stable. We can make these sheets of material fairly open for architectural reasons. So if we want a big opening that people can walk through in the building, or that's easy to put glass in in the building, then we can do a rigid frame. So here we have this framing material. Rigid frames tend to be less efficient structurally than cross brace because in cross brace systems, everything's acting in tension and compression. Whereas here, there are very large bending stresses that occur at these corners. But nonetheless, if this material is thick enough and strong enough, it becomes a stable sheet of material. So here we have a stable sheet of material, and then we have another one on this other side that braces it, and another one here that braces it, and so forth. And this is an example of the structure of the Sears Tower. Uh, all these uh, steel vertical members and the horizontal members have been um, welded carefully together with full penetration welds at all these joints. And then the field connections are bolted connections there and there and there and there and there and so forth. Excuse me, there. Um, and this is what it looks like while it's being constructed. 
And then this is what it looks like after it's clad in this really beautiful um, stainless steel. Uh, there are a total of um, two of these sheets of material running through the core of the building and then sheets of material along each of the faces of the building, uh, which creates nine tubes uh, and they're mutually braced sheets of material at the corner of every one of those sheets. Sometimes you can have mutually braced sheets of material where the material are, they're not planes and, and the intersection may not be exactly 90 degrees, but there is two, there are two sheets of material that interact to create a stable um, core at some point. So here we have um, a barrel vault, which is fairly strong against forces parallel to the axis of it, but really weak against forces in that direction. So when we begin to stretch these strings, we see this tremendous deformation. We can now intersect those vaults and down in the groove here, all this material becomes much more stable. And in fact, it becomes so stable that we can then go carve away the rest of the barrel vaults that are inside and produce this extremely open structure. So this is sometimes called a cross vault or a groin vault, and it is profoundly important in the history of architecture because it allowed the creation of long span, high spaces with huge amounts of uh, glazing or open structure at the perimeter of the building. It is one of the most profound developments in the history of architecture, and it involves mutually bracing sheets of material where that mutual bracing occurs along this groove right here. So that ends our third overview video, um, conceptualizing the structural system uh, through mutually bracing sheets of material.